Now look, a, a few things just to sort of get the ball rolling. Um, Shane has been on a bit of a campaign as have I about formative pruning and sort of getting the basics right. I just want to remind you that always start off with the, the, the principles of, of pruning. Um, don't do anything that's sort of harmful to the tree. And uh, what I find is um, when the uh, uh, big guys come around knocking at your door saying that they're tree loppers, um, I have a very interesting discussion with these guys. Um, and some of you will know who I'm talking about. I've got some Swisho equipment. And usually they are in a desperate sort of struggle to get away from me uh, in the finish uh, because I'm telling them that have they been trained? The answer is yes. Where? In the city. Which city? Because they haven't been trained, they don't know what they're doing. And some of the things that they want to do are downright dangerous. Some of these guys are going to end up in court because they're going to kill someone at some stage. That's how bad it is. But more often than not, they're doing things that are actually harmful, not beneficial. And I'd like to think that you would never do anything that actually harms a tree. Remember that trees are living, sophisticated um, biological systems. So you've got to work with their systems. And if some of you in this room don't know how trees work, haven't done the proper training, go and get it. It's not that hard to get in Victoria. Looking around the room today, I am absolutely delighted to come to these functions because there isn't a group like this in any other city. You, don't, you just wouldn't get 120 people interested in trees coming down to talk about things in Adelaide or Sydney. You get people are interested. You might get 20, you might get 30, but 120 time after time, and obviously, there's only a small number of you here from the previous group. So there's got to be a group of you know, 250 to 300 of you that we're choosing from. So make sure you do understand how the tree responds and what the mechanisms are. Understand the structure of the tree. And I'm going to come back to this in a minute because I want to talk about some of the issues related to what's a branch, what's an epicormic, and those sorts of things from a legal perspective. I don't want people getting caught up making errors of terminology that they could get absolutely pilloried for when things go wrong. They've got a complex biology, comp complex integrative mechanisms, and incredibly complex defence systems, as has been mentioned a couple of times today. These defences, by and large, are the best defences that we know of. So, for example, Peter May was talking about some of those problems with Carimbia this morning. What can you do about it? Nothing. Why? Because we don't know what to do about it. For many of the pests and diseases and stresses that impact on trees, the best way of dealing with them is to make sure that the plants are healthy, that their own defence systems are effective. It's the prevention is better than cure trick. And so often in urban landscapes, we do almost everything in our power to sort of subvert the tree's health and vigour <coughs> and then wonder why things go sort of wrong in the finish. Now, a number of you, I hope, are from this side of town. Um, I'm from this side of town. I've actually slipped home between the sessions this morning. I know all about the soils here in terms of adding to my height when I walk across them. Uh, and I also have had a lot of fun in, in my own garden in terms of getting trees established and uh, developing a proper soil. I find it fascinating, for example, that uh, when the Americans met for the third time to discuss the landscape below ground, they got 20 of the world's best soil scientists to sit around a table and they asked them what was the single most important thing that they'd learned about soils in the previous 10 years and the answer was unanimous, mulch, the importance of mulch. I thought that was telling. Um, stressed and aged trees are really vulnerable and they're vulnerable to a whole lot of things. I think of trees, old trees, a bit like old human beings. Um, the older you get, the less tolerant of fools you become, and trees are the same. And some of the stuff that I've seen with great trees around the peri-urban area of Melbourne, the dumb things that developers, that local government let developers get away with, the dumb things that they do truly astonish me. And there's a certain degree of karma, I reckon, when some of these old trees respond and get their own back. It can be pretty serious stuff. So the sorts of things that we see happening, you know, 
the world's not a bad place. Things have actually improved in terms of arbora culture. Uh, you, you, I've been around in this game for a long time. And let me tell you that some of the practices that I was speaking against in the 1970s, none of you in this room would undertake. Some of the guys that knock on the door with the Frisho equipment and the no training, they still do those things. But people in sort of a, 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 a municipal or a professional capacity don't do them anymore. Prevention is better than cure, and an, a non or minimalist event, interventionist approach is the best one to follow if you can. In other words, don't buggerise around with a tree unless you don't have to. If you can leave it alone, leave it alone. If in designing a landscape, in planning a subdivision, you can leave the trees alone, they will inevitably be better off. I did a study with some students where we looked at something like 600 or 700 urban trees. And we were looking for sort of profound stuff, you know, proper scientific stuff. And at the end of the day, our number one conclusion was, if you give a good tree plenty of space above and below ground and you don't meddle with its canopy and its root systems, it'll look after itself. Okay, now aren't we all lucky as arborists that people don't give them the space below and above ground, otherwise we wouldn't have much of a job. You know, that was the profound study. And always make sure that you're paying attention to pest and disease. Um, this has been a really significant issue. Uh, we used to do a lot of work on making sure that sort of cleanliness and hygiene and pest and disease control were considered as part of our routine, uh, particularly when Phytophthora cinnamomai was really running through our sort of urban and peri-urban fringe, dieback obviously. And then for some reason it sort of wasn't quite so popular and then people weren't worried about what happened when they were working with trees with fusarium or some of these other fungal diseases and then they spread them as you know the story in Sydney. So we've got to learn from those sorts of um, uh, activities and keeping your tools clean is relatively simple. Uh, even I was up in Brisbane last week talking at the um, International Horticultural Congress you know about three and a half thousand horticulturists up there talking about just about everything that you could think of related to horticulture. And one of the messages that came across was, if you're working in soils that, and you're not sure what's in the soil, if you're working in plants and you're not sure what, what's wrong with the, the plants, just make sure your basic hygiene is um, maintained. And they talked about using uh, metho uh, just to clean your, 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 your chains and your bars. Uh, you can use hypo, and yes, it will cause corrosion, but you can, you've got such good oils these days that it's not really an issue. Now, a couple of other things that I wanted to mention to make sure that everyone was on the same page. You know that branches grow on trunks. They're not attached the way our arms or fingers are. Branch tissue be goes, begins growing first in the growing season. This time of the year, you folk out there working with the trees, you see what's going on firsthand. You know how things grow. So why not take the opportunity to watch what's happening over the next, say, 12 weeks and you'll learn a great deal about branch attachment. The branch tissues start growing first and then the trunk tissues grow over the um, branch tissues. And so you've got this bra uh, branch tissue, trunk tissue, branch tissue, trunk tissue. That's the way the structure uh, sort of develops. And the reason we're interested in the branch bark ridge, the branch bark ridge, who doesn't know what a branch bark ridge is, by the way? The, oh, OK, I'll show you in a second. The branch bark ridge is a pattern in the bark that you see on virtually every branch on every species of tree. And the branch bark ridge collars and the like are really important in our pruning, as you all know. But the branch bark ridge itself is just a pattern in the bark. It doesn't mean anything. Why is it important? Because it tells us what's going on inside. I'm going to remind you, some of you, about this. Those of you that use collars and branch bark ridges every day in your pruning techniques, I want to remind you that there are a couple of little tricks that you may have forgotten. So this is the way a branch is attached to the trunk. The black colours, this is from Alex Shigo's work, it's a great diagram. The black tissues form first, side on, front on, and then you can see down here Eventually the trunk tissues grow over it and front on here. Now everyone has seen branches like this 
that are emerging, particularly when they're dead, but that's the way they attach. Now the pattern of attachment is really important because it's the pattern of attachment that makes a branch a branch, not something else. So when I hear court cases and someone says, the branch fell on his head, my first question is, does the person who said the branch fell on his head know what they're talking about? And in about 50% of the cases, they don't. They're talk it's not a branch that fell at all, it's something else. So if you're going to call it a branch, and what a branch is, it's something that's attached in that way. Everyone clear on that? Now why is it important? Because if a branch falls, there are a set of consequences. If it's something else, there may be different consequences. That's the issue, and it is important in the legal system. This is a, uh, a big old um, lemon centred, and you see this pattern in the bark here? For the guys that didn't know what a branch bark ridge is, there's the branch bark ridge. Now, let's just get a couple of things straight. You all know the rules of pruning. The first thing you look for is the collar. Agreed? If there's a collar, you cut as close to but never through it. Agreed? Then if you can't find the collar, you use the branch bark ridge as your pruning guide. Okay, for your final cut. Now, can I just remind you, when you're looking at your BBR, and I am going to ask for a show of hands, who looks on both sides of the branch? Hands up. Okay, not every time, fair enough, but, but sometimes. That represents maybe one in 20. One in 20 of you are looking at the pattern on the one side and not looking on the other. You know that's not the way it works because when you're making your final cut, you are not cutting to a line, are you? You're cutting to a plane, a plane. And the plane is defined by here, here, down here through these folds and on the other side. So you have to look at both sides. Now very often, and many of you know this, the pattern of the BBR is virtually symmetrical or a mirror image, one side and the other. Agreed? So very often what happens, but not always. Now, point about this, if a home gardener knows about BBRs, and let's face it, in Victoria, probably only about 100,000 people do. It's a pretty big number. Chances are if you stuff up in a street, someone in your street, in that street, is going to know about collars and branch bark ridges. That, that's the, about the odds. One person in the street. It's a lot. In, if you went up into New South Wales or Adelaide, how many people in the city would know about branch bark ridges? Bugger all. Just the professionals. So you get away with murder there, not so much in Victoria. So, when you've got your BBR, you always look on both sides. A home gardener who only looks on one side makes what? One pruning cut a year? So if they get it wrong, it's a bit of a shame maybe for them or the tree copes and what the heck. But you folk that are cutting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of branches in a week and thousands in a year, you can't afford hundreds and thousands of those to be off plane because you haven't looked on both sides. And it only takes a second to get it right. Basic rule. Now, this form of attachment is like an O-ring. So what it locks, the branch is locked into position by the trunk tissues growing over it. And if you get two growing seasons in a year, like you do with many eucalypts, you'll get branch fibres, trunk fibres, branch fibres, trunk fibres in the one season. Or if you've got a deciduous tree or um, that you've only got one growing season, you'll have trunk fibre, uh, sorry, branch fibre, trunk fibre, and then the next year the same. So it is like an, an O-ring. Now, the, the, the point about this is many of you in this room, if not all, you're, you're, you're all ARBs, so I could assume you all love gadgets and you're all interested in machinery. Um, and you know how an O-ring works. If anything happens to the top of that O-ring, you're cactus. So when you're making an inspection of a branch, in terms of the strength, what happens underneath is important. 
but what happens above is really, really important. And as a consequence, you can't say that you have adequately inspected a branch if you've not had a look from above. Now, some of you in this room, Paddy Kenyon for example, he would be able to tell you that very often cockatoos for example, they'll get up to the top of a branch and they'll pick the blazes out of the top. It'll be completely decay, decayed and then when the branch falls it'll snap off, it'll leave a bit of a dag sticking out and the cocky's already got the hollow, the making is of a hollow. Now they do it quite deliberately. So these birds and other animals are actually attacking that important point and you've got to make sure that's one of the points you inspect. This is a diagram from Shigo. A lot of people have found this diagram very hard to understand but all it is, it's, it's an explosion of the branch attachment over three years. Here you've got your, I'll use the pointer, here you've got your branch fibre overlocked with the trunk, branch, trunk, branch, trunk and if you push it all together that's the way the system works. So it's, a, it's very much like the o-ring that I just described. When you cut a section through a tree you sort of can see how it's attached. You know there are no fibres above and can you imagine if this area here decays away you've got this coming out and what's keeping it locking it into place? Bugger all. Now the tree goes to great lengths to try and protect this area. All this black stuff here are polyphenols basically trying to make sure that nothing gets in along the top. But if any of you have cut sections of timber like this and in my floor at home I have a lovely uh, Tassie oak polished floor and I have a board that's got the branch coming off like this and the rest of the board running up. Now many of you will know if you cut that board what will that do? It will pull away at that point and often pull away or pull up. Now my board's clamped into position and it's never going to move but it's wonderful to see that there is no attachment along there because I have quite a few of these in the floor so that I can actually be in the room with the TV on and be looking at something interesting. <laughs> now the other thing, the family don't know, I haven't told them. The other thing I wanted to comment on, you all know about codominant stems, right? These are codominant stems. They are not codominant branches and they shouldn't be called codominant branches even if they're way up in the canopy. You know, like a, uh, a snow gum for example. A snow gum grows codominant stem, codominant stem, codominant stem, codominant stem, codominant stem all the way up. They're not branches. Why? Because they don't have the overlocking uh, anatomy they don't have the branch anatomy, so they are actually co-dominant stems. Now co-dominant stems, twin, multiple leaders, V crotch trees, whatever, we don't understand as much about these as we should. There is still a debate about where do you prune and how do you use the stem bark ridge. But what we do know is that they are stems. They are very prone to splitting unless there are flanges and other adaptations to the stresses. So, if you're looking at a tree, particularly if something's gone wrong, you, and you, you know it's a co-dominant stem, you don't talk about it as a branch fell off. You don't in your report for your council say a branch fell. I was down on the Meribinong um, a couple of days ago and quite a large co-dominant stem has come off. It's taken out the fence, fallen right across the path Okay, luckily no one hurt, no one there to be hurt. But in the report, I bet you it's a branch fell off the river red gum. No, it didn't. A co-dominant stem came off. We should get the terminology right. We must get the terminology right because it has implications for how we view trees. Okay, now earlier in the day, for example, um, Hamish was talking about the Carimbia and you were talking about Carimbia henrii. One of the great advantages of Carimbia maculata henrii uh, is that in that population there are virtually no co-dominant stem trees. So if you're looking at Carimbia maculata for urban use, lower growing, 
much better and denser canopy, right? And virtually no co-dominant stems. Go for it. Okay, go for it. It's, it's a really fine tree. So, and then lastly, epicormic shoots. Epicormic shoots are not branches. They are not co-dominant stems. They are epicormic shoots. They're poorly attached when they start. They are fantastic adaptations. And for any of you that are from councils where there were fires in the last three or four years or five years, keep your eye out for epicormic shoots. Okay? Now, the problem is they are fantastic adaptations. They're a response to a whole range of stresses and they allow trees to redevelop their canopy in an astonishingly short time to resume photosynthetic activity, to cope with very high levels of stress. So all of that's a good thing. But they can be dangerous because weakly attached, grow very fast. They can grow five metres in a year, an epicormic shoot. And in some of you may have seen them grow even faster than that. I've certainly seen them grow 27 centimetres in a week. And when you're watching them, you can actually notice the rate of growth from day to day. They do have very high mortality rates. What I mean by that is a lot are produced, but a lot die. Now, having said all of that, if an epicormic falls because it's weakly attached, for example, it might be, let's say, 10 years old, um, 10 metres long, weigh five tonnes. It might be attached by one and a half centimetres of active wood. One and a half centimetres. Never going to hold it. So it peels off. Now, what I think should happen is people should be able to identify what is an epicormic, differentiate it from a branch, and when an epicormic fails, people should say, why did it fail? And very often it's because of bad management. So if your local council has lots of trees with epicormics attached, then your management responsibility is so much higher. And a number of the um, court cases in Victoria over the past 15 years that have involved deaths or injury from fallen branches haven't been branches at all. They've been epicormics. And the legal profession is rapidly catching up with the idea that epicormics are not branches. Epicormics are often a sign of mismanagement, no management, poor management. And they are starting to look at whether it's worth running on these. The last case, by the way, that um, I'm aware of, a couple of years ago now, it didn't end up in court. The people settled on the steps because the insurance company felt that if they'd gone to court, it was an epicormic that fell, the person was seriously brain injured, and they felt that if they took it before the judge, they would have lost, and they didn't actually want to see the set a precedent. So they settled for three million. So this just shows you a young epicormic, very weakly attached. Now, that's a very, very um, quick rundown on some aspects of branch attachment and pruning. And I want to follow those up. Now, a few things that I think I need to remind you about. When you're looking at any pruning practice, always think about the two basic cycles that are likely to influence what you're doing. The first, of course, is your carbon balance. You don't want to prune foliage off a tree if you don't have to because that's where it gets all of its carbohydrate. So the more foliage you've got on, the greater its resilience, the greater its capacity for growth, the greater its capacity for coping with pests and diseases. So the carbon balance is really, really important and something that most of us sort of work on as a first principle all the time. The second balance to consider is the water balance. So if water is limiting and you've got a whole lot of foliage, then the demand of the foliage for the water may not be met and the plant is going to wilt. So you want to think about what's going on with your carbon and what's going on with the water balance. And then the third component that people often forget about is don't forget about the mechanical and physical attributes of the tree. I'd like to think that many of you in this room at least know of Mathic's work. Now, Mathic's work is basically um, 
focused on the static forces that operate in a tree. They are what happens with the tree with its structure and what happens uh, in terms of gravity and the like acting upon it. And we now know that a tree m structure is, grows and develops to minimise the stresses operating within the structure itself. Are you all aware of that? So in other words, the tree grows in a way that minimises the stress because it minimises the strain on its actual structure. And what this is saying to you is if you chop off part of a tree, one of the tree's responses might be that it's suddenly under strain somewhere else and it will respond. And one of its responses could be to shed something, to compensate for what you've pruned off. You probably don't want that to happen. Some of you in the room probably don't even want to know that that's a possibility. And I wouldn't blame you, okay? But it is a possibility. And the other thing that's happened in the last five years is we've really started to get a, 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 a much better handle on the dynamic forces that are operating, operating on the canopy. Now, the dynamic forces are the forces that fluctuate over time. Okay, things that happen to trees when it's windy, for example. And one of the things that we've discovered, and every one of you in this room, every arborist that's ever climbed a tree in a rope and harness, knows that trees are mass dampers. What that means is the foliage and the branches mitigate against wave action and wave patterns moving up and down the trunk of the tree. Because you've all been sitting in a tree where you've taken a branch off and you drop it on and it hits the trunk and it gives you a bit of a tap, but you just, and it's all over. And other times you've taken all the branches off and you've dropped the top and it's come round and it hit the tree and you've gone like that, like a ruler. Agreed? Now, that's because you've taken off all the branches and the foliage. Um, in another context, and I talked about this at one of the Arbor Camps, and we had a bit of a debate uh, I remember amongst the group. Um, always leave some of the branches and foliage on to reduce those wave patterns, otherwise the tree can shatter under the movements um, as those wave patterns go up and down. So, when you're pruning, you're not just thinking about carbon, you're not just thinking about water, but you're also thinking about the mechanics of what's going on in the structure. Am I doing the right thing? Will the desired outcome from this pruning uh, uh, activity be what I want. Now, I just wanted to talk about a couple of these. First one, crown thinning. How many of you are involved in crown thinning? Yeah, quite a few, okay. Now, am I going to cast you as the villain? No, I'm not. You can relax. But let's have a look at crown thinning. Crown thinning is meant to reduce the canopy or to open up the canopy. Now, I'm a horticulturist. If someone wants light in their back garden and you can get it and you can grow stuff under it, I think that's fair enough. I mean, I'm not God on this, so what you want I think is fair enough. So I do think you can justify crown thinning. But you'll notice the word justify. It's not a matter of, oh yeah, I'll come in and I'll thin it for you, no problems. The guy's on the door when they knock, points to my tree and says, I think we should thin it. No, you shouldn't. Why would you want to do that? What's the consequence? Who told you? Where did you read it? What data have you got? That's why they end up running down the street trying to get away from me. And me saying to them, we've got a course at Burnley. <laughs> you can imagine. And, and they do literally run around. Now, it opens up the light, but it provides questionable, if any, benefit to the tree itself. Okay? It's not consistent with the modern pruning principles that I outlined earlier on, the seven of them. You may be able to rationalise it on the grounds that, well, we're removing minor defects or we're getting, dealing with pests and diseases. Have you heard this one? You, you need to open up the canopy on your citrus because of the fungal growth inside, usually sooty mould. Okay, have you heard that one on the radio? Well, do you, can you think of a place in Melbourne where the air is so still that the air is not moving around a lemon tree? I mean, it's just ridiculous in 99.99% of cases. You can rationalise it. 
It treats symptoms rather than cause. Now, I have said thinning for aesthetics. I'll, I'll wear that. And then you recognise, OK, we've got another set of objectives. We've prioritised these plants at the expense of the tree. And then you can manage the tree. OK, we've thinned it out. It might suffer a setback. It might lose some vigour. It might be prone to a, 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 a greater grazing from elm leaf beetle over the summer. And when you're looking at older trees, think seriously about canopy thinning or crown thinning because then the impact can be quite profound. So the practice is difficult to justify and you should only do it when the end justifies the means. In other words, you're going to lose a little bit on this tree but I'm going to gain a whole lot, gain a whole lot on these other plants or this other aspect of the environment. Now what it does, it changes the car carbon balance, it has an impact on your mass damping capacity. So when you thin a canopy, usually in the following storm, that tree will lose bits and pieces. If you've done a good job, it'll only use little bits and pieces. But some of you who have crown thinned will have been called back after the next storm because bits and pieces that you never expected to come off have come off. Um, you've got to watch, if you take too much off, you can put strain on other parts of the canopy that leads to stress that could lead to other failures in the um, branching structure. And then you've got your loss of vigour and of course you may have significant wounding. Now, weight reduction. This one is even more interesting, I think. Weight reduction aims to reduce excessive weight at the end of a long branch. It comes from the application of the simple lever model, right? Now, for those of you that are interested, I've been working for a fair few months at the end of last year on lever models and mass damping for the paper that I put into the Journal of Arboriculture on wind throw. I had to go back to first principles. And it's interesting, the lever model is very, very powerful and very persuasive. Every one of you in this room remembers the lever model from junior science. It's familiar to you. Every engineer loves the idea of something as simple as the lever model. That's a big tree, that's got a big branch, there's a weight on the end, that can't be good. You better do something about it. What will we do? We'll reduce the weight. Okay, so there's an appeal to that, but let's have a look at it. Is it consistent with the basic principles of modern arboriculture? No, it's not. Um, does it stress mature trees? Yes, it does. Is there any proof? that it actually achieves its objectives. Now, what's its objective? To stop the branch falling off. Well, is there any proof that someone's gone and said, this branch and this branch are the same, we'll reduce the weight on this one and we'll leave this one. Oh, and look, that one fell and that one stayed. There is no evidence whatsoever. Now, it may work. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm saying no one's done the study and you can work out why, can't you? How difficult is it going to be to do that study? It's an intrusive. So I think that that sort of weight reduction should only be practised when you don't have any other option. And in some instances, in peri-urban Melbourne, with river red gums up that way and out that way, you probably don't have any other option because your insurers and your managers want some demonstration that you have done something, anything. So that if something goes wrong, they can then go back and say, ha, but look what we did. And you don't want someone like me coming along saying, yeah, well, you did do that. But by doing that, you took off a whole lot of the mass that was damping and that other branch fell. And that's the one that demolished the house or killed someone. OK, so you've got to think this through. I know that weight reduction is going to be done. I know that it's going to be done when there are big branches over footpaths, I've done it myself, okay, or over houses, but I'm not at all convinced that it's actually efficacious. In other words, it achieves the outcome. Something for you to think about. Now, what does weight reduction do? Big wounds, interferes with carbon and water cycle, uh, affects the capacity for mass damping, alters the loads within the physical structure of the tree and reduces the optimization of forces that are operating inside that tree. Now, what all this tells you is pruning 
as professionals is not just about having a chainsaw and chopping a bit off here and there, is it? It's much more than that. And in some instances, some of you are going to need to call on other experts, people who actually do have an understanding of some of this physics and some of this um, biochemistry and chemistry to, to, to give you some good advice. And once you've got that advice, you can then carry on your particular tasks. Now, I want to move on probably where Shane expected me to start. I don't know where he's gone out. He, poor fella, he's, he's sort of been too much for him. Um, formative pruning. Formative pruning. Consistent with good biological principles, consistent with good arboricultural practice, removes branches early, reduces wound size, and reduces time taken um, for wounds to grow over. It's an interesting sort of approach to pruning. The Americans usually call it structural pruning. In Australia, um, we, we're, not, we're a bit loose with our terminology. So I've used formative pruning for many years as a descriptor of pruning relatively small young trees and structural pruning for doing bigger trees. That, that's the distinction I've made. The Americans say structural pruning, that's it. Don't need to, to fluff, fluff around with different names. And I, I don't disagree with them. It's the selective removal of stems and branches early in a tree's life to create a safer, stronger and more aesthetic uh, structure. Now, this, I reckon, is a really strong driver. I've been involved in revegetation projects with Greening Australia since the 1980s, very early 1980s. We've planted thousands of trees and it's always been a great regret to me that there's never been any funding for anyone to go back and have a look at how those trees are doing and what sort of structures they are. I've been back to a number of places and very often if you're planting along a creek the tree is away, it's no hazard or danger to anyone. If a branch comes off or a co-dominant stem falls, who cares? It's just part of the nature of the thing, right? Don't have a problem with that. But what about the ones that are now over the bike path? And in 1983, the number of people using the bike path in a week, you count on the fingers of a hand. Nowadays, the bike path is like bloody Burke Street. There are bikes, peak hour, hundreds and hundreds of them. And you walk along and you think, great tree, why didn't they prune that off? Great tree, co-dominant stem. Just a little bit of work early on with a pair of secateurs, and someone won a pair of Falco secateurs. I'm pleased to see that, uh, Shane. Good to see that you're fostering um, some structural pruning arborists among the group. Just gone along, trimmed a few off, safer tree, better looking tree, all well. So what we did, we, we carried a study with Cameron Ryder um, where we looked at a sort of formative pruning in the early stages to rectify certain problems. And we were asked questions like, if a co-dominant stem is removed from a young tree, say at a height of three or four metres, what's it cost? And then if you left it for 20, 30 years, what's the cost going to be? We tried to sort of not just put the arboricultural side, but the economic side in as well. Now, we had a, a several motives for doing this. One is we wanted the trees to be improved from the start. And of course, as Hamish and Ian know only too well, the advantage of having guys like them around is they'll formatively prune in their nurseries. So when it, the stuff comes out, you've got good stuff. Okay, that's what all nurseries should be doing. And there are other nurseries that do it, but a lot don't. A lot wouldn't even know. And there are a lot who think the bushier it is, the more branches it is, the more saleable it is to the suckers that buy. So we want to get those sorts of benefits, but we also want to get the, the financial benefits to our society and, and to your employers from pruning early. We also want formative pruning to be a priority. Now, every time I've talked about um, formative pruning, and I've been talking about it, um, I talked about it for 20 years before Cameron Ryder decided to do some research on it. Um, so obviously it wasn't the greatest incentive uh, topic that I ever put up, but I did get someone. Um, we talked about it and everyone said, geez, that's a great idea. Yeah, we should do that. No one did it. Because in arboriculture, 
particularly municipal arboriculture, most of, most of you are completely tied up reacting to the crisis. The branch fell. Mrs Kafoop said, the tree is going to fall on my house in the next storm. So all of the resources tend to go to this reactive, what I call big arboriculture, rather than proactive, um, formative pruning with a view to the future. So it's an early intervention. It aims to prevent structural deformities, reduces the need for later um, interventions, consistent with all of the things we've been talking about. It's cheap, it's effective, and as I said, given a low priority. This one should be concluding, and so is given a high priority, shouldn't it? If everything I've said, but no, it's usually given a low priority. So what we did, we looked at a whole lot of trees that were planted out in streets, um, a few hundred of them as you'll see. We, may, we know where they are, we know what sort of trees they are, we measured caliper location, all that sort of stuff. Now the one thing we can't tell you is how good were the trees when they came out of the nursery and were the nurseries good nurseries. So there is an issue there, but we just went out into the real world and looked at trees. 48 Carimbia, 104 Platinus, 79 Pears, 65 Oaks, 52 Elms, 348 trees in all. And when you see, I'm only going to show you a glimpse of some data, which I hope some of you sort of enjoy. Um, others will find the numbers here. Yeah, who cares? What's the take home message? Um, but there's quite a few of them. And what we did was he said, what were the faults? How many pruning cuts were required with seconders, hand saws or the pole pruner, okay, to remedy the canopies? And we timed the whole lot and then we multiplied the time by a factor that allowed for wages, salaries, in other words, the, the business costs. Now, to get to the, the guts of this, what we were looking for were co-dominant stems, co-dominant stems with included bark. Because these were street trees, we were looking for low branching, probably not a problem in your parks and gardens or at someone's home, but certainly an issue in nature strips and along roadsides. We were looking for epicormic shoots, we were looking for suckers, we were looking for broken branches or broken trunks, we were looking for deadwood, and we were looking for rubbing and crossing branches. So they were the faults that we identified in these young trees and which I think we're going to get an opportunity to see some uh, close by here when I finish. And these were the faults that we thought we would be able to rectify. We then looked at a group of 37 trees that had been left unpruned for 20 years and we went out looking for the co-dominant stems, the crossing, dead branches the like, broken split branches. In other words, what we were looking for in the young trees, we looked for in these 20 year old trees um, and we compared the costs of fixing them with the young trees with fixing them as they stood 20 years old. Now a few bits of data that you might find interesting and this is summary data. Um, you can see these are young trees, so they, they're about average 4.3 metres high. Some of them are up to 6. Uh, the mean caliper is roughly 100 millimetres, roughly 4 inches. Um, we, the, the pruning cuts, one with the secateurs, two with the hand saw, two with the pole pruner. And here are some of the overall results. Co-dominant stems, 68%. Included bark, 40%. Low branching, 18%. Broken branches, 14%. Rubbing branches, 12%. The others, almost negligible. And no faults in the trees, about 22%. So if you want the take home message, when you look at street trees, you can think about 20% of them, one in five, no problems. And 80%, four out of five, are gonna have some of these problems. And the most common problems are gonna be co-dominant stems with included bark, and then you're going to have about 10 to 15 percent low branching, broken branching, rubbing branching. Um, some of the species differentials here are quite informative and uh, people from the nursery industry might be quite interested to see this. Carimbia, co-dominant stems, less than 20 percent. Hang on, they're renowned for having it. Who said so? Where's the data? There is the, the data that's available says that Carimbia, roughly, even the worst of them, average about 25% co-dominant stems. But the anecdotal evidence 
is that they are much, much higher than that. Then compare that with the Platinus, 44%. The Pyrus, 60%. And um, the Quercus, but the Elm was the, the, the Perla, 92. Now, some of the nursery folk here might be saying, geez, they must be crummy stock. Okay, and they may well be right. And then you can go down and say, well, 18% of these had co-dominant stems, but only 16% had included bark. But of these, virtually all of them had co-dominant stems and included bark. A um, third of these co-dominant stems and included bark. So these data, if you actually want to have a look at these in greater detail, this work has been published in the Journal of ARB, some of you could actually mine that information and if, for example, you wanted to say to, to your competitors, I get my Carimbia from, and I don't have 18% co-dominant stems, you would be able to do that. Or you might say, there is data that says the Ulmus parviflorea has 92% of co-dominant stems, but the ones that we provide you have 5%. Those sorts of information can be quite useful. And you can also use these in your specs. So, number of cuts made, secateurs. You can see we, we counted them and we talked about branch sizes. So, when you're pruning with secateurs, we went up to 16 millimetre, hand saw 19 to um, 100 millimetre, and the pole pruning 9 to 48 uh, millimetres. And we worked out the average size and the average timing that it took. And you'll notice that cutting with secateurs takes a third of what it does to cut with uh, your hand saw, obviously and your pole pruning is about the same as cutting with your handsaw, and I'll explain why in a minute. The time taken, the average time taken to travel between trees in the street was six seconds. So we allowed for that in the calculation of cost. You know, here's your tree, you walk six seconds to the next one, six seconds, so they're about 10 metres apart in other words. And um, we also worked out how long it took you to inspect the tree. And we came up with a formula. Horticulturists love formulas, by the way. Love formulas, put some numbers down, it makes us look really scientific. Um, and, and, and it sort of keeps us up with the mathematicians and the chemists. Total time, time to prune with the secateurs <coughs> or whatever, um, hand saw, pole pro, and then we allowed 36 seconds here was the six minutes, six seconds to walk to the tree. That meant you had 30 seconds to make a judgment about what you were going to do to the tree. 30 seconds. When I talk to garden clubs and say that a professional arborist can walk up to your little tree and in 30 seconds have decided what to do and basically get on with it, they're flabbergasted. Have you watched the ordinary person with their tree? They walk around it, they spend 35 seconds just walking around the tree trying to figure out where they should approach it from. Most of you, in the six seconds that it takes to walk from one tree, most of you, as professionals, will have already made your decision. You guys do it in the nursery all the time. You'll be walking along. I bet you Ian and, and, and Hamish carry a pair of secateurs in their back pocket. They'll be walking along and without thinking, out will come the second snip and they'll just keep walking. They've made the decision, that branch is rubbing, that's crossing, that's a co-dominant, gone. Okay. So you don't need 30 seconds, but that's what we allowed. Uh, and this is the time taken. Got a bit obsessive about numbers now. <laughs> and these are the costs. And this is, this is the, 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 the crunch end of this. I'm nearly at, at the conclusion. To maintain your, your carimbia costs you a buck if you formatively prune. Your platinus, $4. Your pyrus, $2.76. Your quercus, about $1.60 and your elm, about $3.25. If you work it out, it's roughly $2.80 per plant, per operation, okay? So as you're going through to take a tree that might have a few faults, the average cost is gonna cost be $2.80 if you prune now. Now, if you don't prune now, you can work out three and five percent rates of inflation and we're probably about this one at the moment, but we've done it for both. If you don't do the job now, what's it going to cost in 20 years? And so we found, for example, that if you leave the 20 years, 
to do the same thing that we've just done for $2.80 is going to cost you $44.60. Okay, so you've got a choice. You can go back to your councils and say, we can formatively prune and get these trees looking really good for $2.80 a tree, or you can wait 20 years and pay $44.59. The alternate is to say at a 3 to 5% inflation rate, that $2.80 will cost somewhere between $78 and $112 in 20 years' time. Okay, that's what it's going to cost you. So it's basically saying $2.80 now or somewhere in the $78 to $112 in the future. Anyone, any accountant, any person applying logic would say we'll formatively prune now, but we don't. We're not doing it. So just a quick follow-up, really strong argument for formative pruning. It is consistent with everything that we want to achieve in modern arboriculture. Only about 20% of your trees have no faults, and some of them may even develop faults if the nursery has formatively pruned. And so you might require a second dose. Now, we've done a, a costing on that. We very rarely talk about it. But if you had to do two formative prunings, say three years apart, the cost would go from $2.78 to about $6.50. OK, so two formative prunings, $6.50. Um, Codominant stems are the most common uh, problem. Included bark exacerbates that. And we've found about a third of the trees with codominant stems had included bark. That should be a priority. It would make a huge difference to the urban infrastructure and the urban forest. <coughs> included bark, broken stems, you've seen it all the time. The quicker you get onto it, the better the trees respond. And the folks from the nursery here will tell you, if you get onto those codominant stems in the nursery, you can get a fantastic tree. The recovery is truly astronomical, the rate of recovery. Now, if you've got a five-year-old Carimbia maculata growing out, it's probably going to be something in the order of seven metres tall, codominant stems. You take one off, two years later, no one would ever know that you had a codominant stem. You wait another 10 years or so and the tree is really unsightly for a long period of time. So it's really important to get going quickly. Um, just a couple of other things. Um, pruning with seconders, basically, the smaller the branch, the quicker the prune. Um, we don't want to prune too big a branches here because if you prune too big a branches, you start to run, the thick branches I'm talking about, um, you start to run into oh &S issues with your, your hands. So it's probably better to sort of keep the, the, the pruning limit. If you're going to do formative pruning every day, keep it to about 15 millimetres is probably the best way to do it. And, and it's very quick. Um, now, the hand saw over 20 millimetres makes a lot of sense. Again, for you know, these sort of uh, occupational health and safety reasons. And the pruning saw also has a linear relationship. Now, why am I telling you that? For those of you that have to prepare or help with tenders, the more, th the more and thicker the branches, the longer the, the time and the more the cost. That's all we're telling you that. And so if you've got a whole lot of small branches, you can work out your estimates to a great degree of accuracy. If they're a bit bigger, the time goes out, and you have to make a, a, a few other estimates. Um, now, with the, I think I've got this, the pole pruner, um, isn't a linear relationship, and you probably all know why. Who's used a pole pruner? A few of you. How many of you really like working with it? Thank you. That's why it's not a linear relationship. You got the thing and it's wobbling all over the place and you can't get it firm, so it just takes much, much longer. So 30 seconds is enough. It's a very effective and efficient way of pruning. So quick and easy, suitable for trees up to six metres in height. So a lot of our street trees can really benefit from this. It's safe and ergonomically sound. And you get rid of co-dominant stems, included bark, crossing or rubbing branches, and damaged or obstructing branches. So you, you, you get rid of a whole lot of problems into the future. Now, the advantage of that is if you get rid of all of these sort of, or many of these common everyday problems, it gives you time to do the really important things in arboriculture. Now, it gives you the time to look at your old specimens. It gives you a chance to prioritise without always being at the short end of the budget. So we think 
it's a really good practice that everyone should be encouraging local governments in particular and other utilities to take on board. And finally, as we've said, we want to change the sort of arboricultural regimes. And the other thing about formative pruning, of course, is some, of, some people think, oh, formative pruning, you don't need to be a good arborist to formatively <coughs> prune. Because every you know, sort of person in the street has a pair of secateurs. Everybody knows how to use the secateurs. Well, they don't. Formative rep uh, pruning requires really good arboricultural knowledge and it also requires a commitment to the future. So it's one of those areas where a dedication is required. And just to finish up, um, when I talk to the ordinary person in the street about these sorts of things, and I do a lot of it, you know, one, one talk a week I give on average to the ordinary members of the public, and you talk about these topics, and I ask people, I pull out my secateurs and I say to them, how many of you know how to use the secateurs? And everybody laughs. And I said, no, no, which side do I cut the branch from? This side or that side? And they all think I'm having them on. In other words, they don't, none of them know how to use their secateurs. You all know that the anvil on your secateurs, you don't use parrot beak secateurs, do you? Not for soft material. And the, the anvil, when the blade, the bypass blade comes down, the anvil bruises on the underside, it has to be on the bit that falls. Okay? So most people, they think what we do is really simple. Any idiot can look after a tree. Well, they can't, they can't do it properly. And if you want to get back at them, just say to them, okay, how do you use your secateurs? And if that doesn't stump them, nothing will. Thanks, folks.